difference One cup at a time Yeah, this is Tea time Make a difference One cup at a time So be sure to grab your tea Grab a seat And tune in to Miss Liz Tea time Make a difference One cup at a time Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may be tuning in and listening to Tea Time with Miss Liz. That's right. It's time for a morning tea time where I am today. I have an incredible guest that will be joining me today, Linda Jamson, and we will be talking about risk-taking, all the incredible things that this amazing woman has done. She's an author, musician, traveler, and a good old risk-taker, and we all need a little risk in life. So, before we start the tea time, a little disclaimer and then a little intro on the amazing guest that will be sitting and having tea with me today. And let's find out what her TEA is. So disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Times live show. Miss Liz, myself, I am going live on StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by Miss Liz, myself, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forth dialogue and opinions that are not re representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the given time of airing. All Tea Time guests are, and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment in taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions for some what may be emotionally at risk. It is significant to know that this show is engaging in discussion forms only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about this disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookiemissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in this show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect that as well. And I will see you at a future show at a later date. Now I'm going to jump my guest on in here, and then I'm going to introduce this incredible lady. Welcome, Linda. Oh, hello, Miss Liz. <laughs> Thank you for having me on your show. Well, it's an honor to have you here on the show with me today. Now, I'm just going to do a little intro on who Linda is, and then we're going to sit and get some information from Linda. I'm going to pick her tea and see what seed she throws at us today. Linda Jemson is an American expat writer, musician, living in Finland. She grew up in New York, holding a book in one hand while exploring the piano keyboard with the other. Memor mesmerized by her mother's playing of the romantic repertoire, she soon studied piano and her later and later graduated with a BA in music from Band College. Linda is also an avid chor choral singer and has performed in Hungary, Finland, the UK, and Israel. During her years in Boston, Linda raised funds for a variety of philanthropic philanthropic causes and completed the graduate management course at the Radcliffe Seminar Harvard. However, longing to return to her musical roots, in 2001, she moved to Bud Budapest, the land of her musical idol, Franz Liszt. Am I saying that right? Liszt? Franz Liszt, yeah. Uh -huh. Franz Liszt. Yeah. My tongue sometimes, it just rolls. I, that's my that's my accent. I don't know. Must be the Norwegian accent that I have. Oh, so, yeah. as, so for more on Linda, you can check out her full bio on Miss Liz's Tea Time page on Facebook, on all my social medias. It is there. And it will also be in the description for anyone who is listening to the audio of this Tea Time today. So Linda, welcome to Tea Time. Yeah, thank you. So could you share a little bit on who you are and how it all started, the journey, the traveling, the music, the writing, all that good stuff. Could you spill yeah. some tea with us today? Sure, I'd love to. Um, as you mentioned in my bio, I've been a musician from a very early age because I was very taken with my mother's piano playing as a child. 
and I was really lucky because then she one day sat me down on her lap and she taught me how to play piano. And I got private lessons, I think, almost every night from her for years. Um, so I just grew up with this love of music and mostly the romantic repertoire. That's what she played. A lot of Liszt and Chopin, Mendelssohn, Schumann. So that's the music I gravitate to. Um, then I studied music at college, as you know, and I'm, after that I moved to Boston and I moved between Boston and New York most of my adult life. So then what happened when this all, uh, my odyssey began, I was 41 years old. Actually, it, it happened on my 41st birthday. I was expecting a marriage proposal from my long-term boyfriend, Hank. We had been together seven years. And he had been acting kind of mysterious. It seemed like he was planning something. I thought maybe he was calling my parents and organizing an engagement announcement or something. Uh, but nothing panned out. I mean, nothing came of it. So on that particular day, I also graduated from this Harvard Radcliffe program. So we had this graduation birthday party. And, you know, there were a lot of gifts. He, what he had organized was getting some gifts from friends who were out of town. So he was accumulating cards and gifts, which was very nice. But at the end of the day, there was no proposal. Okay. So... <laughs> <laughs> us women are so so hard to <laughs> yeah. right we're like we want it now <laughs> yeah so we had been together seven years and i think because i had graduated and i was 41 i started to think okay now is a good time i've been so focused on my career and what about my personal life and i wanted to explore the idea at least of having a family with him and he was totally not interested and his idea he was not also not interested in marriage long term. He wanted to just ha have things continue the way they were. And it was difficult because the things were good. I mean, in the moment, day-to-day in, in -day life with him was good. We lived together and we seemed happy together. But I just had this like nagging feeling that um, if I continued to stay with him, I knew I would be giving up some of my own personal goals and you know, going along with his. And I don't think that's right. So I thought, you know, okay, I could do this maybe a few more months, maybe even a few more years, but ultimately I'm going to be disappointed and bitter and I didn't want to be that way, you know. So I discussed this with my best friend, Jenny, and she said to me in a very direct way, well, if Hank, you know, isn't going to propose after seven years, 10 or 15 might not be enough either. And, you know, that hurt, but I thought it was truthful. And I thought about it, and what she suggested was that I go to see her psychic. And as a birthday gift, she sent me to visit her psychic, Angelica. And Angelica is a, a major character in the book that I wrote, the memoir, Odyssey of Love. So this is how the journey started, really. I sort of against my, my feelings, I thought it was a lot of hocus pocus, you know. I went to see Angelica, and I have to tell you the reason why I was open to it is that I learned many years ago that my mother had seen a tea leaf reader before meeting my father in New York City. So she had been engaged to someone else and she had a lot of issues or concerns about that, that guy, her fiance. And she went to see a tea leaf reader and the woman said to her, this is not the man for you. You're not gonna marry this guy, but there is a man coming into your life with the initial J and you're going to meet him and get married within six months. And lo and behold, my mother met and married Joseph. Wow. In six months. And they were married 48 years until he died. Oh, Very goodness. Happily, yeah. So I thought about that and I thought my mother had seen a tea leaf reader and this was like part of their love story. And I thought, well, okay, I'm not gonna poo poo it because it worked for her, you know? So I went to see Angelica and I was really hoping to hear that Hank would come around, you know, that he will wake up one day and just realize that he wants to be with me and, you know, we'll, we'll get married, maybe have a family. And um, But what she said was actually the exact opposite. <laughs> the first thing she said was, you're going to move to Europe. And I, I mean, and, I, and Hank hated to travel. He was really afraid of flying. So I knew that he wasn't going to be in that picture, you know. Yeah. So um, 
I, I didn't say anything at first. I thought, okay, Europe, yeah. And then she said, oh, and this person you're with, you know, he's not the one. And the man you're going to be with is a, a tall man with glasses and he's waiting for you overseas. Oh. She said, uh, he won't come into your life for a while, but when he does, there will be a Russian icon involved in your meeting. And I thought that in a way it sounded crazy, but in another way, it was really fascinating. And um, my grandmother was, my, my father's mother had been Russian. And so this whole idea of the Russian icon, Russia, like it was sounded very mysterious and and I my interest was definitely piqued, you know? Yeah. And, and then she said that I would reconnect with music and I would be moving overseas and and she saw like stringed instruments around me. She heard like clarinet, she she saw me on a stage, and I thought, wow, like it just seems like kind of far fetched, but it was like if I dare say music to my ears. It was really fantastic. It was wonderful to hear this. So I was really thrilled that life seemed to have so many possibilities at that point. But at the same time, I was really like heartbroken about Hank. And I just thought, hmm. So I had a decision to make. And um, I went back, I talked to Jenny, I talked to my parents, I was open with them. And um, everyone was very supportive of my idea to go on this Odyssey, which is what Angelica called it, an Odyssey. That's why I called my book Odyssey of Love. Yeah, I was going to ask you why you named your book that. Yeah, because Angelica said that about the Odyssey. And then there's this wonderful quote by Franz Liszt, you know, my idol. And he once said that my life was nothing but an Odyssey of Love. I was fitted only for loving. So wow. I got the title of the book from that quote from Franz Liszt. And, and because of what Angelica had said. So that started me on my way. And when I thought about where to go, um, I picked Budapest for that reason, because of my love for Franz Liszt. There's the Liszt Academy, where I wound up volunteering and then singing later. And um, there was also this international house where I could train to be in, like an ESL teacher, basically. Uh, so I picked Budapest and it was an incredible experience. And I moved and I just took a big leap of faith um, that it would somehow work out. And not because of what Angelica said so much, although that always stayed with me, but it was more that I really felt really ripe. That's the word, I was ripe for adventure. I was really ready for the next part of my life. And something was definitely missing. It was like the music was missing, um, this feeling of having a future with someone who wanted what I wanted was missing. You know the idea of a bit seeing a big picture and i was 41 and that was kind of scary so i just like went for it you know and i had always wanted to travel and that's the other thing i had not traveled so much abroad i had been on a few trips abroad but never like anything in depth you know so that was something i had really wanted to do that i had put off and that was something that hank was not at all interested in so so you no. actually got your leaves re read or you went and got your cards read? No, I just, uh, just a psychic. She didn't read cards and she didn't read tea leaves. She just like an intuitive. So she just closed her eyes and she, I describe it in the book and she just started seeing images, you know, and hearing, hearing voices and coming, talking to my higher guides. That's what she said. I don't know who they were, but. <laughs> Well, they actually took you on a journey because you've traveled, like you've went to Budapest, you've went to the UK, Finland, like you've been all over. The... So yes. where's, where's the your funny... favorite place? Well, um, during my odyssey, I traveled a lot around Hungary. Like there's okay. Vienna, you can take a, like a two hour train ride to Vienna. I went oh. to Greece to visit my cousin, Athens. I went to Slovakia and uh, then Brussels and Germany, Poland. I went many places I don't write about. But in the book, I write about uh, Ephesus, Turkey, and Israel, and Amsterdam, mostly, and Tinos, a little island in Greece. Um, my favorite country actually is not one of those. It's Italy. Oh, and have yeah. you been to Italy? You've been yeah, to Italy. I've been to Italy, and I keep going. That's where I want to spend more of my time. It's, I think Italy has everything. But um, I, love, I loved a lot of these countries, too, like Turkey. There was, oh, and Israel, it was just wonderful. But one reason I traveled was because I thought 
I was moving back to America, I thought that, you know, I gave myself two years to meet this person and to teach, you know, English. Then I thought I would go back to America, hopefully with this guy, you know, and then go back to my career. And um, so I just thought, okay, I'm gonna get in as much traveling as I possibly can. Because when I go back to the States and I get a new job, I won't get much vacation time. So that's why I was just, <laughs> every time I had a break, I was traveling as much as I could, you know? So then the funny thing is I, I picked Finland. I came to Finland at the end and where I met this small man with glasses, which is not a secret, of course, because I live in Finland. And uh, I thought, you know, the day before I met him, I was like rushing all over Helsinki, the same thing. I'm never coming back here. I went to like the Sibelius statue. <laughs> I went to the <laughs> island. I was just running all over Helsinki because I thought, you know, I'm never coming back here. So isn't that funny? Isn't yeah, that it funny? is. My life turns out. But yeah. it, the risk have really taken you on a beautiful journey as well and that you're able to write and share about it. As yeah. So your your book is based on the love story, correct? Yes. So it's uh, the story begins in Boston and it ends in Helsinki. And it's, you know, a search for this man, but along the way meeting a lot of imposters and other tall men with glasses who usually had some sort of issue that, did, you know, the relationship didn't work out. And also a lot of singing because while I was there, as I mentioned, I had volunteered at the List Academy and then I was invited to join the um, Budapest Academic Choral Society. So while I was singing with them, we actually performed at the List Academy a few times. And then we went on tour in Israel for three weeks at Christmas time, which was oh. really one of the highlights of my musical life, maybe the whole highlight of my musical life. So that was fantastic. So I got to do things there that I wasn't able to do or hadn't been doing in Boston. I had been so focused on my career and my my relationship, you know, and um, so it was a really big, huge adventure. And I'm really glad I took that risk, that I just went for it, you know. I was so open, and I have to say, I think that's a big part of <clears throat> what you attract. It's how open you are, you know. Yeah. You, how right you are, how willing, how know how just you're open and and actually when my husband uh who's very shy actually Finnish men are stereotypically very shy and um when I asked him years ago why he came over to me he said he felt compelled to come over to me because I just exuded this like happiness and joy and like just like that I was open and I remember feeling that way I was really happy you know, I knew my adventure was coming to an end, and I, I thought, like, I haven't met this guy, but I'm moving back to America, but, you know, I've had this wonderful adventure, and I thought I was wrapping up my odyssey, and so, but a, another one was beginning, a totally different one, you know. Yeah. Married life. So. so, for the listeners and viewers out there that are tuning in or watching the replay, what has the greatest aspect of your life been being a risk taker? What has it taught you about yourself? One thing that's happened for me, and I think maybe for others too, is that even though the risk can feel very frightening and actually leaving a comfortable situation, like when I left Tank, that was actually a comfortable relationship. Frustrating, but it was comfortable and a comfortable job, you know, with a good salary. Um, in all these situations, I learned that there was actually something more appropriate for me or that's something that made me happier. So in the moment, I might have been like frustrated or scared to, to take a chance, but I always learned that what came next was better than what I left before. Like it was a growth experience, yeah. maybe really took, maybe really painful to, to get to that point. And I mean, I suffered a lot, uh, you know, emotionally before I left Hank. I was, it was about six months before I left and, uh, you know, a lot of disappointment. And I felt I had given a lot of years to the relationship. I'm sure a lot of people feel this way, you know, when a, when a relationship ends and you just feel like, oh my gosh, I gave so much now what? You know? <laughs> seven more well, you kind of, you kind of guard yourself, right? For the next one, you're just like, am I going to give it another seven years to somebody else? You know? So you always have that fear, of, you know, especially when you're in long relationships, anything over a year, then you start to question, oh, 
is the next one going to be another, you know? So we start to self doubt ourselves a little bit, but I really love that you were so open and traveling. And so for the listeners and viewers that are listening, you know, sometimes things scare us, but we just got to take that risk and we got to just go for it and got to jump. And sometimes what we think is what's supposed to be for us isn't for us. So that's, you know, that's really, that's a difficult lesson to learn. And I've felt this also with jobs before, you know, I, my dream job would come up and I'd interview for it. And I would just think, oh my God, I really want this job. Like I'm, it would be so perfect for me. And then I wouldn't get it. And I would just be like, oh my gosh, you know, that would, I, I thought it was a perfect fit. And yeah. same thing for a relationship. You could meet someone and you think, oh, like he's really great for me or whatever. And then that doesn't work out. But then always there's someone I thought for me anyway, more appropriate or that made me happier. You know, yeah. that just, it just seemed easier. And actually I remember being frustrated with Hank for some years about little things. Well, like traveling, for example, I, I was really ripe to travel and I really wanted to explore and he was holding me back and that was the yeah. reality. But I just kind of went along with it, you know, at the time. Um, and then when I met my future husband, I expressed to him my desire to travel to St. Petersburg because it's so close to Helsinki. And I think it was celebrating its 300th year anniversary at that time. And he was so easygoing. He just said, well, okay, we give our passports, you know, we'll take take my passport and you go to this <laughs> office downtown and just like, then we get a visa. And he was so like, matter of fact, and we'll take the train there and we'll stay at a hotel. So he was just so easygoing and, and, yeah. and it was just like, you you know and i hadn't realized i'd been holding on to this like frustration for you know i felt like i was just sort of always trying to pull hank along like you know or well we and it holds you back right and it starts yeah. to drain you and and then yeah. you start self-doubting oh well maybe i'm not supposed to travel maybe yeah. it's just a dream let let's stop talking about that you know i'm the same way i want to travel and i'm with someone who doesn't want to travel like he's oh. a homebody and i'm just like you know what well then i travel by myself because i that's just need to, i need to do it and if that's something that you don't want to do then we you know, I go and travel alone and you stay at home. That's your choice. You're happy. I'm happy. Like, yeah, no, absolutely. You have to do it because you'll just yeah. be frustrated if you don't. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, and he'll be happier in the long run that you're happy when you come back and you have it. You can talk about these experiences and you'll just be more feeling more fulfilled. Yeah. And actually, I never did that when I was with Hank, actually. I always stayed, you know, it was the homebody or I was studying for this, you know, going to graduate school at night and on the weekend and my job and visiting my parents who lived about two hours away. So life was full with these other things. So I wasn't so focused, but it was always sort of a nagging thing, you know, yeah. because I thought, well, if I do settle down, if I do have a child someday, you know, I want to travel now before that happens. So, but little did I, I had no idea I would be traveling so much, you know, in a short time. So, but it was, it was all fantastic. You know. Well, and you've seen some really beautiful places, so yeah. I'd love to see pictures. But we, we have to have like a, a an after tea party. I I do want to bring in that you were part of the Queen's Jubilee that just happened in June uh, last week, I believe, right? Uh, so how was that well, experience you. for you? Yeah. Oh, it's wonderful. You know, I have been involved with the Anglican Church of Finland or the, the Church of England here. Uh, for about 15 years, because when I moved here and I didn't speak any Finnish at all, I didn't, you know, I couldn't really understand what was happening in the, the Lutheran church, the Finnish church. So a friend of mine here who's German, actually, she suggested I play piano at the church here. So I started to play piano and that's how I got involved. And then at different times I've sung in the choir, you know, the church choir. So what happened was about a month ago, the, the, the choir director asked me to sing. It had been two and a half years because of Corona since I had sung anywhere. It had been actually at the same cathedral art. It's called Tomio Kirko, the big cathedral in Helsinki. I hadn't sung there since Christmas 2019 with this wow. choir. So he asked me and I thought, oh, okay. I thought, well, okay, things are getting better now with Corona, I'll take a, take a chance. So I went to, it was about two or three weeks of really intensive rehearsals and beautiful music and some of it, some of the Queen's favorite pieces. And one piece that was 
played actually at her coronation 70 years ago. So we, we stood up in the organ. There were about 20 of us or more. And um, we had a fantastic organist. And we had um, the, the British ambassador was there and some other diplomats and some war veterans and all sorts of, I mean, it was a really interesting mix of people and people from different uh, denominations, church denominations. And so we had a three, about 300 people. Oh, wow. Great. Yeah, it was wonderful. And I was so happy to sing again. I can't tell you. It was so wonderful. And after that, we had a very lovely reception down in what we call the crypt. So we did that. And then two days later, our church had a big tea party. Shall I show you my teacup? <laughs> oh my goodness, gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. Thank you. Uh, we had a tea party after the service in the yard of our church. So um, that was, I had bought this really big cake and it said 70 Jubilee on it. And everybody brought food and scones. I love scones, like scones. Oh, me too, I love scones. Yeah. Oh, like homemade scones, it was fantastic. So. We had a tea party and there was a cutout of the queen and we, you know, we took pictures and there were activities for children. And then we had a bunch of our um, congregants, older guys spoke, uh, sang sea shanties. And that oh. was funny. It was really fun. Yeah. So it was really a blast. It was, it was a lot of work, but it was really a fun weekend. And then when it was all over, I think it was Monday night, they showed the, um, the Jubilee concert here that had been edited. They showed it on TV on Monday night. So I watched it finally Monday night. So, and then I, so that was interesting. I didn't see so much of what was happening in the UK until then. Yeah, there was a lot of things. I was trying to tune in as much as I could, cause I'm just a big, I love the queen. The queen is one of my role models and yeah. we have the same name. So my goal is to meet, meet her one day, you know, and just actually sit down and have a good conversation with her and, understand yep. because she and she had it hard you know she became the queen at a young age and oh. her life her life really changed it impacted a lot you know and she didn't really have a say on how her life could be so oh. you know and she, said, she said at her coronation and i read uh, because they gave this book to everybody to read in the church to the, from the church of england and she actually said at her coronation like i didn't pick this path you know personally and so oh. i'm asking for your prayers, you know, and um, because it helped to help me get through this time. And she was very open about her faith. And actually at the, at the, um, uh, what was it, at the church service we had on last Friday night, the ambassador of the UK actually spoke to that. And she said that she had been in diplomatic service, the ambassador for 35 years. So she said, just imagine having double, a double career. 70 year career really that's a it's a long time long right time. and so you know a lot of us whether we're british or not who are involved in the church of england like we really admire her and for her service and yeah. um, and as the head of our church so it was really wonderful to celebrate that well i have great respect for her because she her life was mapped out for her right she didn't have yeah. a say yeah. on what she could do or like she's seen some incredible places, but she's really had to just more or less go where she was told to go, you know? Right, right. I know. Yeah. And, and always having people follow you and watching you, I, I don't know if she ever has privacy. And I don't know what it's really like, but if you watch the Netflix, The Crown, I'm sure yeah. you Yeah. Yeah, I, I do watch that series. I'm. I, that's a beautiful series. They've really done it really well. The, yeah. the, the first three seasons really well the next couple of seasons i don't know they changed the queen and they yeah that it, was different. i like the it, first queen. yeah you know. the first three seasons i i like they they did really well with finding the actress for the queen but the last couple of seasons i'm just like what are you guys doing like this is yeah and i don't know if they're going to have a sixth season maybe they are that would be yeah but I, I keep re-watching the first three because those are my favorite. I'm just yeah. like, oh, I don't like the I don't like the actress that plays the new queen. Like, you know, like Olivia, was it Olivia? Yeah, Coleman, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so now so Linda, I would like to get into what is your tea? Oh so, okay. Well, so you know, for all the listeners out there, when I ask the guests what is their tea, I'm asking 
actually looking to see who they are as an individual. And by them giving me their words of their tea, it actually tells me who they are or what they're doing in the present moment, either their life tea, their moment tea, their day tea. So Linda, I'd like to have your tea today. Okay. So for tea, uh, I picked the word, I picked three verbs. And the first one is take. Oh. So take a chance. Take a leap of faith. Take a break. Uh, take control of your life. Take five. Take stock of your life. So that's why I picked take. I, it would be easy to pick travel, but for this, you know, I want to make this point across. So, I but that also time. that also tells you who you are because you're a risk taker. So you yeah, take, yeah, take chances. Take <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, and I wanted to also add that another reason I like this verb or word is that when I met my husband, his name is Otto, or we say here Otto, and oh. he, and his name translates to the verb to take and finish. Well, look at that. And if you come someday to Helsinki, I will show you around. And you will notice that the ATM machines say Otto, O-T-T-O. -T -T -O. Oh, well, look at that, eh? Yes. So we say we go to the Otto machine. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd love to come and visit. That, that is my goal, to meet all of my Tea Time guests in person. So that is on my bucket list so yeah I, if i have certain guests that are in one country maybe we'll have a group tea party or something with miss liz but i'd love to meet all of my guests in person the well, virtual land is nice but i'd like in-person stuff as well but you know it was confusing because i i saw these auto before i met my husband i saw this auto everywhere and i thought do they sell lottery tickets i was thinking of like lotto i don't know <laughs> lotto auto <laughs> And then when he said his name was Otto, I was like, what? Just like, you're everywhere here. Like, but um, so that's why I picked the take, because I think take in, in a good sense, you know, yeah. not, not give and take, but just to take something that you. But it also tells me a lot about who you are, too. Care. And to take care of yourself, yeah. to take care. You know. And for E, I picked uh, experience, to experience something. So in keeping with this theme of to take a chance or to take a leap of faith too. So to experience something that you is your heart's desire, for example. So for me, it was like to live abroad for a while and to find like lasting love with somebody. So that was, you know, I was ready to take a chance for that experience, you know, and to see what came of it. Or just to take an experience, like to experience something outside your comfort zone that maybe is a growing experience for you, whatever that, for example, I, I taught English there uh, to, to Hungarians. And that's something I never ever had wanted to do or ever thought I would do because I hated public speaking. And, you know, it, it terrified me actually, the idea of getting up in front of a classroom of students was terrifying, but I just, I just took a chance because it was part of the whole odyssey I had to support myself and work. And that was really the way to do it there. But see, so, your word experience also explains you in the moment. The experience of sitting I'm and sorry. sharing. The, the word experience is also the present moment because you're having an experience right now. You're sharing and you're opening yeah. up. So this, yeah, is, yeah. this is where the T comes in. This is where the past, the present, and the future come in. And it's amazing how each T is different. Not I one T is the same. And, and that's know. what I really enjoy about sharing and spilling the tea on Tea Time is because each of my guests have a different tea. And you're actually telling me who you are as an individual. See, your past, you took a chance on the past to take that risk, to travel, to, you know, and the experience of today, you know, sharing the Jubilee, sharing the tea with me, the experience of the moment, you know. So it, it tells us a lot who we really are without even understanding that we're teas. And, you know, I was told many, many months ago that I should get on podcasts and talk about my book. And I really was like, oh, no, that's not <laughs> That's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> and here you are today on Tea Time. <laughs> oh, boy. I, I thought, no way. But it took me many months to, to come around. And, and um, as you know, Nicole helped me line some up. So yep. that was like months ago. And I think you're my 10th one now. So, yay. Yeah. I like that. Number 10. I like the number 10. Yeah. So, um 
yeah, so this is part of that experience too of the whole being a new author and putting yourself out there and and experiencing new things. The whole past year has been an incredible experience, you know, um, with the book. So, I mean, we could talk about that for hours and I won't, but that's been an amazing experience. And actually living through Corona, the epidemic has been an experience because um, actually it wasn't until lockdown really in March, whatever, 2020, uh, that um, I was serious about publishing, to really serious about publishing my book. I thought it's now or never, you know, um, because I couldn't sing, I couldn't play music, no one was going to church, no one was socializing. Yeah. So I thought, okay, now's the time. I had it had been edited and I had gone to writers conferences, and so that was the opportunity. So that was also an experience. I mean, publishing something as a first-time writer during the pandemic. I mean, I think a lot of people did that actually. Yeah. There are a lot of books out there. You know? There are a lot and there's a lot more books coming. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> but so, people don't, are not actually buying the hard copy books. They're yeah, buying the yeah. e-books. And I find that that's taking away from the whole experience because I love books. Like I'm in, I'm, I'm going to be in seven, it'll be seven books this year. And I like holding the book, especially when the box comes in and you see the book and you see your words in a book and you can hold it. It's a whole different experience. Completely. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I have a Kindle, but I much prefer to read books. You know, yeah. my, the only reason I got the Kindle was I wanted to see what my book looked like on the Kindle, that the format was okay and everything. Yeah. And I, I, there's some Instagram writers that I, I buy their stuff on Kindle because sometimes to ship a book from the States, it's just, it takes during actually during the pandemic it just took forever to get here if it even arrived at all so yeah. i just a kindle but i think experience to experience is is a great word you know yeah that was that's the e and then the a word is act so act on it you know, i like what, it what have you learned from the experience and from taking a risk and you know um are your goals, have you met your goals? Are they on the, still on the horizon? What can you do? How, like, how can you change your behavior? How can you act to, to get at them? And um, so I think I like that word. I like act or action, you know. Act. And, I, and I think that's a good word for you for the future is act. Yeah. Because have you ever thought of putting your book into a film or a movie, a love romance? Oh, I mean, that, that would be, it would be wonderful, but that's, uh, I mean, I don't even sort of, I don't think about that because I, I think you have to be more of a traditionally published writer and have like an agent behind you and something. Oh, you but never I, know. No, you never know. I mean, you never I, know who's listening to Tea Time. You just yeah. never know. <laughs> I'm, tea Time is really out there. So you never know. There might be somebody that's saying, hey, Linda, do you uh, want to make your book into a movie? Oh, like, it, would be, it would be a fantastic idea. I think it would be a really good idea for a movie. And I think it's, and the reason I say that is because it's hopeful, you know, and it, I think it brings hope to people. And I've gotten a lot of really positive feedback from people who've read it, even men. And actually, mm -hmm. it's funny because I always thought my target market was more women of a certain age. And recently I was speaking at my friend's um, uh, English, English club and I went there and at the end of the, they were interviewing me about my book and how I published it and asking a lot of really great questions. And at the end of the session, I gave away two books in a raffle and two men won them. It was two men. And I said, wait a minute, you're not in my target audience. And one <laughs> said, what? He said, but love is for everybody. He said, love is for everybody. And I thought, that's actually a great point. Yeah. And so the next day, what I did was I took all the selfies I had gotten from men over the last year, and I posted them on my author page because I wanted to show that Odyssey of Love is not just for women, it can be for men too. Well, there's a lot of romantic men out there. Some of them are just a little hidden more than others. Yeah, but I think it's just, uh, yeah, I think, you know, it's a happy love story, but also there's this intrigue about the Russian icon, which I think makes it more mysterious and where is it? And so I'm traveling like to Israel, Greece, Amsterdam, and I'm wondering like, okay, this guy could be the one, but where's that icon? And like. You know, so just being aware of that too, and and what does it look like, and yeah. you know, I won't give it away because <laughs> I, I I think 
make an awesome Hallmark love romance movie, you know? Uh, I, I mean, I think so too. So I don't know. We'll see what happens. I mean, I'm totally open to it. Yeah. For any of the listeners that are out there, if you know anybody that's into making movies, I do have a few people that have some connections to film. So I could kind of give them a little nudge and say, hey, check this book out, <laughs> you know, because I think it would be an incredible story, especially at this time, you know, where we're all really isolated and just the story of the travel and f the love, you know, we really need to bring that back into society as a great love story, you know. I think so. And after all these years, we're still happily married. So that, that's something too. Oh, there you, know, you go. Right. You got the proof that it worked. <laughs> the love worked. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I mean. Take a chance and, you know, and things usually for me anyway, they, they're, they're better when you take a chance. They, it takes time and it can be frustrating in the beginning and difficult, but ultimately I think it's, it's, you're being true to yourself. That's the main thing. Yeah. When you're true to yourself, you attract what you, what you need, I think what's best for you and that's what happened yeah well whatever you put out there comes back to you i'm, I'm a firm believer on yeah. that you know if you give good you're going to get good if you give bad well you're going to get bad yeah. you know uh, i'd you. like to share I, i'd like to get to know a little bit more on your writing experience how was that for you you said this is your first time writing right yeah. so how was that for you uh i don't know if i shared with you how i started to write it was because of a tragedy actually um just after I met my husband and just after we got engaged, my father died suddenly oh. uh, and unexpectedly. I'm it deeply was, sorry. Yeah, it was awful. And I didn't end my book on that note I, I, because it happened. So, well, yeah. I won't get into it, but I didn't want to end my book, my book on that yeah, note. Yeah, we won't give the goodies away. Everyone go out and grab a copy. <laughs> but what happened was um, I was having a very difficult time and um, it was suggested to me that I should write as therapy. You know, it's very helpful. Yep. So I started to write stories about my dad and then about my mother and about family and other people I knew. And then I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to start to write about what happened in Hungary. So I wrote about one particular situation there. And then I thought of others. And I realized that as I was writing, I really enjoyed it because I was going back to this really happy time. You know, when my father was alive and life seemed a little more carefree. And um, so I could recreate conversations and relationships and travel experiences. It was really, really interesting. So it was really a great exercise. And, and at the time, I thought of it as an exercise, really. Oh. And then what happened is that these chapters started coming and I could see sections forming and then sections would come and then I could say like a whole okay, so that's like part one, part two. Then I, I knew the arc, like I knew the beginning was Boston and was Helsinki. I knew the people, the main characters. And then I thought, okay, yeah, I see a story here, like a good story. And because I lived it and I knew it was a good story. So then I decided I would like workshop it at a few um, conferences. And while I was traveling in New York twice, I went to conferences and I got good feedback. And that kept me going. Uh, I met one agent in particular. She didn't handle nonfiction, only fiction. And this is what I repeatedly found is in terms of my writing experience, in terms of traditionally being published, was that all the agents I met at conferences wanted me to fictionalize my book, the whole thing. Oh, wow. Because, of course, it's easier to sell. You know, women's fiction is really huge and much bigger than memoir. Yeah. So they wanted me to, and they said, think about it. We'd be interested, you know, I'm meeting with you, talking again. And I would leave thinking, oh, it, that just didn't feel right to me. You know, I just thought everybody that knows me knows this happened to me. And how could I write it as fiction? It wouldn't feel right at all, you know. So I ultimately decided that's when I really finally had it. I was in the Stockholm Writers Festival. I think that was about three years ago. And I just then decided, okay, I've heard this now from so many different agents. Now I'm going to self-publish. And then the pandemic came and sort of just pushed me in that direction. And so the writing experience was wonderful. I mean, it was lonely. You know, of course, it's lonely, as we all know. But it was also uh, joyful because I was going back in time and, and having, you know, these adventures again. You know, because so much of my daily life was, I was just very sad about my father for a really long time. And I had 
been, and I was in a marriage and uh, in a new place and I had left my career. So everything was the opposite of what was before. But I, I was wonderful. It was wonderful because my, my husband was really supportive and he had lost his father at a really, really young age. So he helped get me through that. And I think that was meant to be that he did. So, um, but that's how I started writing. And then actually while I was writing Odyssey of Love, I was writing about present things, you know, that were happening. And that's where the the um, sequel comes in, Triptych. So I've already written a lot of that. I have to go back to that. And then I wrote fairy tales. I wrote a Christmas picture book. So I have like a huge cabinet actually right here. <laughs> full of stories that I've like printed out, you know. And uh, I just have to at some point get serious and sit down and decide, put them in order and decide like, am I going to self-publish these or am I going to try to find a publisher? And I think for children's books, absolutely, it's, you know, pretty necessary. Otherwise, it's really expensive to publish on your own with the illustrations, you know. So um, what is the difference between self-publishing and a publisher? Oh, well, for me, it was that, um, well, the, the good thing about going with a traditional publisher through an agent is they have a huge, I mean, they've got the contacts. They do so much marketing. They've just got so many connections. It's like throughout the world. They have, you know, they can get the book, you know, foreign rights. They can have it published in different languages. If I had done that and I had a publisher, it might now it might be published in Finnish or Hungarian, but but it's not. And that's because that's something I would have to initiate, you know, or pay for probably. But on the other hand, the reason I liked or I like self-publishing is that I'm in control of the process. And so, for example, I did not fictionalize my book, not the whole thing, no way, you know? Yeah. I didn't want a publisher or an agent to say, no, scrap scrap that whole chapter, forget it, we don't want this character, you know? We don't want to hear about Bea or, you know, so, or, or whoever. Um, or, you know, change the title, change the cover, whatever. I just didn't, you know, you lose so much control actually when you go with a traditional publisher. So that's, that's, for, that's for me, the big issue is the control issue. And I think because it's my first book and because it's a love story and my love story with my husband. So it's, it was really important for me to self publish it and do it the way I wanted. In the future, that's different. You know, triptych, I would be open to traditional, I think, um, and certainly with children's books, you know. So when is book two coming out? I don't know yet. <laughs> I, oh, it's still in the working process. Yeah, <laughs> I, um, I've been so busy, quite truthfully, still with marketing this and with, you know, getting on podcasts or trying to get on podcasts and doing, promoting my book and, and doing, now getting back in music finally and doing some traveling. But I have to really get serious and get on the schedule. And I will not publish in the summertime, though. I, I, that was, I think, a mistake. I did it last June. It was on my birthday, actually. And that was fine, but then summer came and I just wanted to, you know, finally relax and take a vacation. And it wasn't so easy at all, you know, to do that. Yeah. It was, as you know, you have to focus, you can't just disappear. You have to be on social media and see what's happening on Amazon and be attentive and, and answer your fan, you know, your fans who write you or write reviews and thank them. And so, you know, you just have to be aware of what's going on. So. Uh, this book will be, it, this book is uh, much more spiritual. Well, actually, the first book, this book, Odyssey of Love, has a spiritual thread running through it because of the, the uh, icon. And, um, and But the second one, it's much more so because of my father's death. And, uh, and there's more Angelica, there's more Jenny, there's more, you know, uh, yeah. about, it's more, the focus is more in married life. And like spir spiritual pilgrimages I've been on, at, you know, when times when there were really some difficult times in my family or, or illnesses, that kind of thing. So it's a different focus, but it's also a hopeful, it's a focus, it's a hopeful story as well. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll have to check it out. And I won't get a Kindle because I like reading. I like holding the book. Yeah. I, I do have, I do, I do support a lot of uh, my guests that have written books and I get the Kindle first. And then I'm just like, I need the hard copy. Like, yeah, I, know. I, I just need to hold it. I need to. And I love having a library of knowing the authors. 
instead of having a, a library full of just books of people that have written books, I love knowing that I know each of the authors who have written a book who's in my tea room. And I can actually say, I know that person. Like, I know Brenda. I know Joe. I know Jen. You know, I can say all of those things and actually get into the story a little bit deeper because I have that personal connection with yeah. the author as well. I've met a lot of other authors on Instagram. Um, I, ha I had hesitated really even setting up an author account and I was really encouraged to do that. And I'm glad I did because suddenly all these other memoirs were reading my book and they were posting reviews. And, and even today, actually, oh my goodness, I, I got someone tagged me on Instagram and I was wondering, what is this? And she wrote a review about my book many, many months ago, maybe last oh, wow. year. And she's doing a podcast and she gave a four and a half minute review of my book. And oh, I, that's amazing. Yeah, I know. And like, I didn't even know. So of course I thanked her and I listened to it. It was lovely. And, um, and then another woman recently did a young woman. She looked like she was about 25. She had my book and she was all excited. And she had this like <laughs> travel image, big travel image from behind her, like with the airports, like, departures you know and everything and like she's talking about traveling and everything so sometimes you don't even know this is happening until you google yourself oh yeah google yourself you'd be surprised what you find i i i did that and i was like whoa i'm oh i'm he oh wow <laughs> oh okay <laughs> and, and where people are getting a reading from your book that happened too. my friend's daughter was doing a reading of my book it was like whoa so yeah. It's, so this has been a really fascinating journey for me. And I've met like like you, people from around the world. And it's so important now because we've been so isolated. And that's one exactly. thing I really enjoyed with the podcast is meeting people from all over. You're in Canada. I've uh, I've had two podcasts with people from Austria. Oh. Um, and of course, America. Yeah. I've had a couple of people from Austria. Uh, yeah. One from New Zealand and one from Australia. Yeah, yeah, and I'll tell you too. So, yeah. um, so it's been really a great experience. And yeah. yeah, wow. And that's another thing, you know, you don't realize until you also take a chance and you do something like this too, that it opened up all sorts of other doors and meeting lots of other people that I never thought I would. If I had just, you know, during the pandemic, just stayed at home and played piano and read or whatever. Yeah. So. But well, that's what I, and, and, and this is why I have tea time because for me, number one was my mental health. I didn't yeah. want to be isolated during the COVID. And I was already doing similar to this with Sacred Hearts Rising, the series that I'm in. And I was just like, how can I keep my business going? Because my business actually started in 2015 where I was doing fundraising tea times, tea parties in the community. And I was like, well, how can I keep the tea going? And my, my Oma kept telling me, you're the tea, you're Miss Liz, you're Miss Liz. And, and that's all I kept hearing was Miss Liz and tea, tea, tea. Okay, how am I going to do this tea? You know, and I love connecting and getting to know different people from around the world. Their different traditions, their foods, their, their adventures, you know, their scenery. There's so much, you can actually travel. Like I've traveled to 130 countries in three years and right on my own chair. So it's almost like I'm in a time machine and I'm going and I'm traveling all over through a wow. cup of tea. So I've actually gotten to know a lot of different places and incredible people like you, Linda, like oh. had it not been for what I'm doing with tea time, I would have never connected with you. I would have never got to know you. you no, know? I don't know. That's, it's, a, it's a gift really. It's yeah. the, the, the only positive thing to come out of the pandemic, I think, is that We've, some of us have really, or a lot of us have just connected with people we never would have before you yeah. know, around the world, but we've, we've been forced to do it. And, you know, if you want to stay, stay sane and continue to socialize. Well, know. I think it really has brought people together. You know, oh, so, for some people, it has been a struggle because they were that person that I'm just going to stay at home. I'm just going to do this. And, you know, where other people were engaged and what can I see? Where, where can I go? You know? Okay, I'm stuck at home. What can I do? Yeah. You know, and uh, a lot of people started podcasts. Yeah, just like people started writing books. People started writing podcasting. Yeah, yeah. I, I started my writing journey in 2017. Well, I, I've been doing poetry and songwriting and that since I was a little girl, but I mean, my actual writing, I started in 2017. So. And you have seven books, you said. There'll be seven books by the end of the year. 
Wow, good for you. Congratulations. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I'm working on my own solo project that I'm hoping to have out by Christmas time that I'm not saying too much about, but uh, I've done seven anthologies. So I've written with many different authors around the globe as well and gotten to meet people that way through writing. So uh, now it's time for Miss Liz to do Miss Liz by herself. So that's a scary journey. That's a risk. Cool. I'm, <laughs> that is a, that is like a travel. I, it is scary. Like when you write with other people, you know that you can moral support, right? But when you're yeah. writing by yourself, who do you talk to? Who do you like, uh, okay, what do I, you know, give me some encouragement, give me some, give me some tips or something. I, I don't have that when you write for yourself. Right. And as you know, oh. yourself, right. Is like you can speak to people, I, I'm writing this chapter or I'm doing this, but you know, you really want to keep it hush hush because you want to kind of make it as a surprise and get people to really get engaged and say, wow, this is what she's been doing for three months because she's taken time off and, you know, so yeah, it's, it's scary. It's one of the scariest things I've ever done is taking this step. And I've been wanting to do this for many years and now it's time. I think after seven books writing with other people, it's time for Miss Liz to do Miss Liz. But um, have you? Are you open to having beta readers, like you know, people you know read your book? Or oh yeah, for sure, yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah, and there's also I understand a lot of online groups. I don't belong to one, but I actually um, sent my manuscript when it was like still. It wasn't like the the, the polished manuscript, but I sent different versions of the manuscript along the way to some friends of mine and, you know, to critique it and they were very helpful. And then I had some professional editors around along the way to give me advice because I thought, you know, I've never written anything and, you know, so it was really important to get feedback from people, but I know what you mean. You're sort of working in a vacuum and especially here in Finland, you know, there are not so many, or actually there's no, that I know of, there's no uh, English, book writing group at all you know no English writers group here so I'm not part of that everyone writes in Finnish or Swedish which is the second official language so um yeah it's been difficult that's why I like to go to writers conferences when I can and I'll be going in August to the one back in Stockholm again I'm glad after three years oh that's cool I really meet people and and um, I've gotten a lot of good reviews from people there too they've read my book I've read their books so that's a really good way to, to network too. So what final words would you have for the listeners and viewers today? And for all of the ones that are watching the replay, please push hashtag replay and where you're tuning in from, because I'd love to hear where the audience is actually listening to the tea times. So Linda, your final words for the viewers and listeners today. Uh, so if you feel that something is missing in your life or you feel um, d disappointed in some aspect, whether it's your career or your home life or your partner or your goals aren't being met, like as was the case with me, just listen to that voice inside, listen to your instinct and then like visualize what it is that you are looking for in the future. And then really decide if you're willing to take the chance to go for it. And and have the courage to do so because it's been my experience i really feel like something better is out there for you something waiting for you and you just have to really want it and work for it and be brave enough to just go for it and i think you will attract it and and i think that's my my words of wisdom <laughs> at this point because i know this has happened to me not just this time with the odyssey but in, in other ways like even I can remember my 20s and 30s, I had some really hard decisions to make. And, you know, and I just decided to, you know, take a chance, whether it was financial or with a job or career or something. I moved to California at one point and um, got involved in a, in, a, in a charity at one point. I put some money behind it and I volunteered for many, many, many months without a salary. And then boom. Um, a year later, we had Goldie Hawn as our guest star. Oh, our, my goodness. At our fundraiser with 1,200 people, which I organ helped organize. And I suddenly had a job because we had grants coming in. We had money. So I took a chance. And that's just one other situation. Um, so I think if you really believe that you really, like, you really feel like you can really almost, like, feel it, taste it, that there is something out there for you, 
you believe that there's something better or more appropriate, more satisfying really for you. And just you can make the work it happen, make it happen. And that's what I did. I took a chance. I thought, okay, I'm not going to get paid. You know, I had some money in the bank. My parents helped me. I asked them for help, whatever. And I just thought, I just feel like if I keep going, this, the, the momentum was there, the context were there, um, that something good will happen from this. And it did. And then from that job, because I, I was very I poorly paid, actually. Uh, but then the next job, I made like a, a double the salary because I had suddenly all this experience they were looking for. So, so that got me. That's how I got involved, really, in philanthropy or you know the nonprofit sector, like you are. So, yeah, I just took a big chance there too. So, as you know, it's not about money. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> it is not about money. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it, I wish we could have the money, but it's not about the money, right? It's oh, and so yeah, it's fulfilling. It's really, really fulfilling, and that's what attracted me to the nonprofit world. Like, yeah. I worked for this one foundation. It was an AIDS foundation, and my job was to, I was like the wish fairy, we called it. So I was matching people who were sick with wishes, like their last wishes. For example, a trip to Disneyland with the family, or art supplies, you know, for someone who wanted to paint or a sewing machine for someone who wanted to sew a quilt, for example. So it was really, really fulfilling. I mean, like no amount of money can make you feel that good, actually, I think. Yeah. Well, the, and, and, and a lot of people don't understand that feeling of complete abundance without the currency. It's yeah. the life change that we actually make. You know, uh, there's no price. It's priceless, the feeling that you get when you help somebody. Yeah, I no, I agree with that. Yeah, and actually, yeah. With my T word—that was one word I thought of for A was abundance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna take that word too because that 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 is you. So. Yeah. Well, I want I want to really thank you, Linda, for sitting and having tea with me today and sharing your story. So, if anybody out there who is listening or has watched the tea time. Please, uh, the tea times are available to be shared. Uh, if you'd like to reach out to Linda, you can get her on her website or you could check her out on Facebook. And she's also on Instagram. Uh, all the description will be in, all of the details will be in the description box for the audio podcast listeners out there. And I want to thank you again, Linda, for sharing your tea. You know, oh, take, oh. take, take thank experience, you. take experience act. And I like that because it actually is your tea and it really is a good strong cup of tea. And that's all we do here is we serve strong tea. We sell and serve yes, like to that. make a difference. So, so I really want to thank you. And I want to thank all the viewers and listeners who have tuned in today and sat and enjoyed a cup of tea with us or a cup of coffee or your favorite beverage. You do not have to drink tea to enjoy a tea time with Miss Liz. <laughs> And I will see everyone back here on June 16th at 3 p.m. where I have another author coming in and she'll be sharing her story. And she'll be coming in from Canada. And her name is Jennifer Leb Leberman. L Lieberman. I hope I'm saying it right. I'm sure she'll correct me when we sit down and have tea. But she'll be sitting down. She's an actress and she has a story to share with us about filmmaking and all that good stuff. So, like I said... Linda, you just never know who's tuning in and who's watching. Ah, so yes. oh, wonderful. I do connect the dots. So we will stay connected after tea time as well. Okay. So again, thank you to all the viewers and listeners out there for joining me today and having tea. So. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> so don't leave. We will talk in the back of the studio. But again, thank you to everyone who has tuned in today for tea time. <laughs>